androgenetic alopecia has a distinct pathological process, right? This process is influenced by a combination of hormonal changes, particularly 5-alpha reductase coming in contact with testosterone, which produces DHT. And people who have the genetics for androgenetic alopecia, when the DHT comes in contact with the androgen receptors in the hair follicles, it suppresses them and ultimately causes them to essentially die in the long term. So you have this destructive process to skin tissue or a skin structure being the hair follicle itself. Because eventually in that area, if nothing is done to prevent that sort of miniaturization process, the hair follicle is replaced with scar tissue. Not only that, but androgenetic alopecia is often comorbid with other conditions like seborrheic dermatitis. And we know that seborrheic dermatitis has a basis in androgens, particularly DHT. DHT likes to make the sebaceous glands in the scalp overactive, and this causes the scalp to produce sebum that has high triglycerides and cholesterol content, which ultimately leads to certain bacteria growing on the skin and further inflaming the skin of the scalp. And seborrheic dermatitis itself is a skin disease, is a skin disorder, but because it's more painful than androgenetic alopecia, there's an urgency to address it. But something doesn't need to be painful for it to be treated or seen as a disease, or even a disorder. Alopecia areata is another hair loss condition. And here it's almost often painless, but it's the immune system that's attacking the hair follicles for whatever reason, and primarily it's genetics, but we're seeing the immune system destroy a fundamental physiological process of the hair follicle, which is its ability to grow hair. So because it isn't painful, are we going to say that alopecia areata is not a skin condition, is not a skin disease, is not a, you know, a disease of the scalp? I don't think we say that. I don't think it's responsible to even suggest that. And now you have emerging research that also potentially implicates DHT and androgen receptors in macrophages, a type of white blood cell that is crucial in the body's immune response and typically involved in wound healing and inflammation. And the inflammation, which is a fundamentally protective and reparative process, has often led to chronic inflammation, right? If there's something that's causing you to be chronically inflamed, that can actually become very detrimental, leading to tissue damage and prolonged injury, potentially exasperating hair follicle miniaturization and permanent loss. So these macrophages, these white blood cells that are involved in the immune response to inflame a certain area to try to clean things up, they have androgen receptors. And in theory, there might be some sort of genetic basis here to it because this isn't happening with everyone, right? But in theory, DHT could overexcite the androgen receptors in these macrophages causing for a runaway inflammatory response that can potentially lead to other hair loss conditions like CCCA, LLP, and much more. Even in androgenetic alopecia itself, there are inflammatory aspects that ultimately result in further damage to the hair follicle. So I'm saying all this to tell you that, hey, there's a reason why they refer to androgenetic alopecia as skin disease or skin disorder. And just because in most people, there's no pain involved or associated with it. That doesn't mean it cannot be classified as so. Also, I found this particular study titled, quote, Dihydrotestosterone DHT enhances wound healing of major burn injury by accelerating resolution of inflammation in mice, unquote. And this study is really interesting. I'm not going to review it here, but it goes to show how DHT can accelerate the inflammatory process and wound healing in mice. Now, I know this is a animal model, and it's not even an animal that's closely related to humans. But for those of you who have been keeping up with the vertiporfin videos that I've been putting out, and along with the vertiporfin case reports and clinical trials being conducted by Dr. Barguthi and Dr. Bloxham, and also what we know about mammalian healing when it comes to wound healing, and the inflammatory process with YAP signaling the yes-associated protein, and even SDF1, I think we can also look at DHT being a significant factor in that excessive or fast wound repair. So it can heal wounds pretty fast, or contribute to wounds being healed fast by starting the inflammatory process sooner due to the androgen receptors that exist 
in these cells that are responsible for wound healing. So that would be the fibroblast, the macrophage, neutrophil, monocyte, B cell, T cell, all these things. That DHT can potentially upregulate and cause for inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling, which ultimately results in fibrosis. So I know this is a bit out of the topic of the video, but I have to address it here. If we're going to use vertiporfin to reverse fibrosis or scarring that has occurred on the scalp, and even to bring back and restore miniaturized hair follicles, I think we do have to address the microenvironment that exists in that particular area. And that would be DHT. We want to reduce DHT as much as we can in the scalp so we can potentially control those runaway inflammatory responses that may be caused by DHT. So yeah, I have to just put that in there. Maybe I'll cut this out and upload this as its own video. If this is uploaded separately, this is coming from my response to Bald Cafe's video that addresses the hair loss industry essentially playing on people's fears. So.